Good afternoon all. So thank you for joining us for another of our free CBD sessions um, to, to support our RQTs uh, within their induction into the career and equally just teachers in general. So well, today we're joined by Zara Peskett, who's going to be talking us, to us about metacognition. So I'm going to welcome Zara to the stage. Hi, everyone. Yeah, um, I'm Zara Peskett. Uh, I'm assistant head teacher at Shenley Brook End School, which is a kind of large comprehensive uh, in Milton Keynes on the west flank of Milton Keynes. Um, we're more widely part of the Five Dimensions Trust and we've got our leadership and training centre as well. Uh, but more importantly, I am a psychology teacher, uh, I'm an ECT mentor um, and generally a little bit of a pedagogy geek. Um, so that's why I've kind of decided to come and say hello to you guys today. Metacognition is one of those things that in the last kind of five to seven years has really great traction, if you like, uh, educationally. Um, a lot of that sparked by a report by the Education Endowment Fund, and we'll get into talking all about that um, as we get on. So my first question for you um, is a question for you to put in the chat box, please. And my question to you is, you can only pick one, okay? So I know it's been a long day, but you can't sit on the fence, so get off the fence. Um, if you had to pick one, do you think teaching is an art or a science? I'll just give you a second to pop that in the chat box. Okay. Art can be honed and improved. Science can be formulated. I like that. Yeah, I've been asking this question quite a lot around my educational setting and um, I'm working with some of the ECTs as well um, as a local partner. And it's a really interesting one. You either get a really sure answer or people that think it's a bit of both. And when they're kind of forced into one side of things, they're a little bit uncomfortable. Um, the reason I ask, oh, and I've got another one, brilliant. Science mainly because progress we measured in behaviour can be studied scientifically. The psychology link, brilliant. And I'm a psychology teacher. Um, so I absolutely, to a point, agree, Chris. But yeah, what the discussion tends to centre around is what you very much um, caught in the chat box here. Um, it can feel like a science if we're being quite evidence led and if we're looking at progress. Um, it definitely feels like a science when we're looking at things like cognitive load theory, working memory, uh, schematas, that, that all sounds quite sciencey. Um, but there's a part of you that, that would like it to be an art. And actually, I said earlier, I'm a pedagogy geek. The pedagogy is the art of doing something, the art of being able to master something, um, in this case, um, teaching and facilitation. Um, some answers I've had previously when I've asked people this, um, art because it's messy and art is messy. Um, and I think I would definitely feel for my, you know, primary colleagues on that, uh, or bottom set year seven would definitely say it's a little bit messy. Um, and also an art maybe captures the engagement and the enjoyment side of things and the meaning. Um, so I just want you to think about that going forward because metacognition is quite often seen as a science. It's seen as something that's associated with the social sciences. Um, and it's where that meets practice and reality that I think we, we, we need to get to. So if I was to ask you to make a scarecrow face, literally where you're sat now, your currently current reality, how would you do that? So in the chat box, if I asked you right now to make a scarecrow face, what would you do? Yeah, grab items from my desk to make out a face, pen, keys, etc. Brilliant, Ben, thank you. As a dance teacher, I would use my movement to trace the shape. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so I actually did this as a whole um, school staff training and asked this question. And the reason for that was to just see people's prior knowledge very quickly. So I had staff that just kind of shook up their hair so that they looked really raggedy. I had staff that were grabbing, like you're suggesting, men, pens, bags, whatever they could get hold of. Um, doing this online, I did wonder if any of you would say, I would open up paint and I would draw a scarecrow, which would have been a completely legitimate answer. Um, but we're on a little bit of a theme here, and I want you to see if we can spot the theme as you go. So I'm not gonna tell you what it was, but there's some kind of key questions that I could, I could ask you. I'm not gonna get you to put them in the chat, um, I'll just pose them. But how did you know how to make the face? How did you organise the task? And how successfully have you managed the task? Now, I imagine if you were physically doing that, you would have been asking yourself all these questions, particularly if you've had a certain amount of time or you were with a collective. So you'd be thinking, okay, scarecrow face, how do I know how to make a scarecrow face? 
you might have been thinking of images down the bottom um, you might have been thinking more about Julia Donaldson's The Scarecrow's Wedding if you're primary um, but you'd have been thinking how you might be able to organize the task so you'd have been grabbing things you might have been opening paint in your computer the practical would set in so you'd be assessing your prior knowledge the practical of how you were you were doing it and then you would hope as you were going through the process you were being evaluative even if it was as simple as i don't know i was going to use kind of pens for my hair okay which pen would i pick well i'd, I'd probably pick the yellow one because i i associate being a scarecrow with straw so all of these processes will have been going on and these processes happen from a really early age okay you've got a child here it's not my child and i do have permission to show these so don't worry um who has put this exact task um, and it's where I got the idea from my my training from, you know, early year settings are brilliant at doing metacognition because they'll have said to the child, this is William, um, they'll have said to William, you know, what what bits are you going to pick out? Um, what do we need for the eyes? Right, eyes are round and he, he'd go off into the craft drawer. Um, what's really interesting is that the, he picked lots of different colour raffita to go around the outside and that's because he had recently been looking at Julia Donaldson's um, The Scarecrow's Wedding and the Scarecrow in that has lots of different colours through its hair so that was his point of reference. So what are we trying to say? We're trying to say that metacognition is about being able to ask ourselves questions and become a self-regulated learner. Now, like I said, metacognition has very much come to the forefront um, of education recently. There's, you know, lots of schools have it as part of their guidance. There's been lots of reports. Um, whether or not you've come across the Education Endowment Fund before, um, the Education Endowment Fund is a government funded organisation, um, which basically does lots of evidence and lots of research initially to set up um, its focus was on on the disadvantage, but actually quite a lot has been seen in terms of evidence collected and how it can help the wider audience. So the idea is obviously just like medicine has their accepted body of evidence and psychology, the education needed that as well. Great resource. If you, you haven't been on there, I would definitely suggest going on. They've done some reports recently around uh, assessment and feedback um, that are starting to be filtering into schools as well. But basically, the Education Endowment Fund sets out in its metacognition report and there's a refined version which is this poster I always like a shortcut so the whole report is kind of 30 to 40 pages but in its refined outcome it, it kind of comes to this and it basically says that teachers should acquire professional knowledge on metacognition and if they do so they can improve the amount of months progress um, that children make anything ranging from from seven to nine months this is the definition that we use in school uh, when we're talking about metacognition. And I think that would be a really good bit of advice for you. I know you're RQTs, but very quickly, I'm sure you'll be looking at, you know, moving into leadership and we're all leaders in education, um, no matter what stage we're, we're at in our career. Um, but I find a really useful thing to do is to establish a working definition of metacognition. Um, I picked this one, which is out of the Education Endowment Fund report, but there are others. Um, and metacognition is the way learners monitor and purposefully direct their learning. And that links to self-regulation. So self-regulation, if you wanted to do the shortened hand version of this, is the extent to which children, which learners, are aware of their strengths and weaknesses. And if they are aware of them, how they can impact on their own process. So some people use the definition that metacognition is learning about learners. Um, I'm not a massive fan of that one, if I'm honest. I think it's more about that the students can direct their learning so all sorts of connotations should be being used there about kind of independence um, about being purposeful about assessing strengths and weaknesses etc so metacognition to me is plan monitor and evaluate now this circle can be huge or it can be small so what I mean by that is within any sequence of learning, I would hope there will be opportunities where there is a foci on planning, planning what you're going to do, monitoring how it's going, and then based on evaluation, that going back into your planning, this is a full, full circle. But in any lesson, you would expect there to be planning, monitoring and evaluation in mini cycles. Um, if you put a quiz on a board, students come in and they're kind of planning how they're going to answer those questions. Um, they're monitoring their own progress as they're doing it, which ones am I finding hard, which I'm not. And you would hope that they're evaluating based on that, what their gaps in knowledge are, 
but so many children would come in and not be aware that that process is happening and then not do it purposefully. So I would say metacognition, one of the key words that's maybe not in that definition is about it being explicit um, and making it explicit to the students, making it clear that that's kind of what you want from the task. So as teachers, we're very used to this as well because we plan a lesson while well, we're teaching our lesson. If we're doing it well, we're monitoring how it's going, we're tweaking, we're moving the dots, we're making it harder, we're making it easier. And then at the end, if you're lucky, just before you go and grab a cup of tea or the next 30 arrive um, or the next task, if you're in primary follows on, um, you're evaluating how that went and thinking right next time, how, how are we gonna start? How am I, how am I gonna plan that? So I'd just like you in the chat to put in a lesson, what my evaluation looked like. That might be an activity, it might be a task. So just in the chat very quickly, if you had to evaluate during a lesson, either at the end or in a mini cycle of the learning, how might you do that? How do we evaluate? Oh, I love a mini whiteboard, Ben. Yes, questioning mini whiteboards. Yeah, discussion with taught partners, absolutely, listening to groups. Brilliant. So I'm not going to get into talking about plenaries and mini plenaries, because I think at times, they sometimes did education injustice, an injustice, sorry. I remember when I was doing my teacher training, it was all about plenaries. It's the time for the plenary, the mini plenary. Um, and it was always this idea, plenary by definition of the word means at the end. And I've always thought, well, if it comes at the end and only at the end, that's not very helpful, is it? You know, you find out as they walk out that nobody got it. Brilliant, uh, start again tomorrow kind of thing. So yeah, everything you've just put on there is, is really effective. And I'm sure if I'd have put, you know, exactly the same for plan and monitor, you might have actually given me the same answers. So how do you monitor? Well, that could be a whiteboard, that could be a quiz. Um, but it's about being explicit, explicit that the activity we do, what is its purpose? Is it to plan? Is it to monitor and evaluate? Um, I'm quite comfortable with sharing this language with students. Some schools do, some schools don't. I, I do think the success at our school is because we have um, we don't have metacognition lessons. Um, I know some schools, you know, have whole schemes of work on metacognition or it's it's a tutor um, time programme. We just ask our teachers to explicitly refer to it when you're teaching. And um, so you might say, you know, share this and say, you know, when we're doing this task, we'll be evaluating or we'll be planning or this is very much an evaluation lesson. You know, I teach year 11, they're all coming out of mops at the moment. We're very much evaluating where we are but with the purpose of the planning. And I think if anything, the gap between three and one background um, is, is in my opinion, very important. So when undertaking a learning task, we start with our prior knowledge and then we apply and adapt it. And there's been a lot about prior knowledge. Um, the new Ofsted framework is very knowledge focused, um, knowledge being um, according to the Ofsted framework, long-term um, learning or long-term change to knowledge. Um, and we plan, don't we? We planned for it and we adapt it. Um, but it's not just about the prior knowledge, it's about planning how to undertake a task. Um, and while we're working on it, that, that monitoring and evaluating. So uh, we're not necessarily on discrete steps, but an ongoing cycle that should underpin um, all that we do. So that cycle, I think, is integral to metacognition. So it's hidden in plain sight. So Sometimes I would reveal it to the students afterwards as a kind of reminder. So did you plan beforehand? Did you assess the resources available when I was asking you to make a scarecrow? Did you monitor your progress along the way? Were you looking at your neighbour's scarecrow? Did you like their scarecrow more? Were you looking at the board where there's a picture of a scarecrow and comparing yours to that? Because that, that would be scaffolding. And then did you evaluate your scarecrow? Did you put the eyes on and go, mm, not there, not happy about that, move them up, move them down? So plan, monitor, evaluate is always hidden in plain sight. It's exactly our cognitive process, but the idea is about making it meta, about making it observable. So we know how this works, and I'm sure those of you that you um, were doing your training over lockdown and you were sat at the end of computers like we are now, it had real strengths to it, but it also had real weaknesses. Now, don't get me wrong, I was super pleased to get back into the classroom, but I think it's really important that we take the gains as well as as maybe the perceived or actual losses um, of working in this way. Um, expert learners, and I'm sure if I said to you now, you're expert learner, you could you could think of a child, the child that they get it and they get it in your class and they don't just get the knowledge, but they get what they should be doing. Um, in our expert learners, these metacognitive processes are unconscious and automatic. Uh, and the thing is, you are an expert learner because you've become a teacher. 
So you must have been an expert learner along the way. Um, but we don't necessarily take the unconscious and like I say, make it conscious or explicit, whichever word you prefer. So some children develop metacognitive skills naturally. However, others need to have these taught. And that is why teacher modeling and scaffolding is so important. So I just want to stop there and ask you a quick question in the chat. Um, what is your understanding of the word modeling or scaffolding? You can pick. So I'm looking for in the chat, uh, definition is probably too strong a word, but your understanding of either the word modeling or scaffolding. And if you can put which it is, that'd be fab. Modeling is demonstrating how to construct learning. <laughs> and a thinky mm. um, modeling is demonstrating success criteria and scaffolding is providing a framework to support success in learning yeah scaffolding providing further support demonstrating in a different way love that yeah so absolutely right your modeling is a bit about you students can model as well but when we're modeling it's a kind of a how-to um, I always use the phrase with my learners, it's a role model. If I said I want somebody to model this, I would be looking for them to, to show a good example of it, absolutely. Um, and then scaffolding, yeah, showing different ways to answer, supporting, yeah, it's one of the key things under quality first teaching. I'm sure you've heard that a million times when you were trying to be evidencing all those standards, differentiation and quality first teaching. Um, but there are two things that I just think are, are timeless and that the reason they have lots of different names like scaffolding um if you said to any teacher from kind of 1980s what scaffolding they go writing frames or sentence starters because there was such a huge thing about it um during the kind of every child matters agenda um but differentiation quality first teaching scaffolding support frameworks whatever word you want to use the reason there's so many names for it is because it's a timeless key point um and modeling you know whether it's calling it the expert, whether it's the modeling, whether it's the show, whether it's the I, me, you, it, it's got lots of names, but those two things I think are integral to practice um, and how you do those can massively um, support. So I want to try and not just give definitions during this session, because I always think they're very helpful, but actually you want something that you can try in your classroom tomorrow, something you can give a go, do something that you maybe you haven't done before or do it in a different, more purposeful way. Um, so this here is some kind of questions that you, you can use to support. Um, again, as a school, we're very keen on sharing being a metacognitive learner with our students. And we might have these up. Actually, there's a fair few of these up in classrooms around um, our school um, just to prompt students. So like, where do I start? You know, what have I learned from the examples we looked at earlier? You might be asking these questions, but they hopefully over time will come to ask them of, of themselves. Am I doing well? Um, do I need to do anything to improve my work? How did I do? Did my strategy work? All these questions can be really helpful. Um, some teachers have them on word mats um, around their room, but just a constant training, if you like, of students to think in this way. So that might be a resource that you might want to just stick on a board, stick to the side, share with students, or you might have a particular tricky task that you want them to reflect on these as well as, well, um, as you're going along. You can get students to ask them of each other. So a possible resource that you might want to use just because it's it's nice to have one of those. And again, being practical, what might they, like this look like in my classroom? Now, I shied away from doing this. So like I said, I did a, a whole staff training on metacognition and whole staff training is always fun because you've got such a mixture of experience and, you know, that won't work in science. And well, in maths, we do this. And well, when I was at my teacher training, it was called that. Um, and, and you pick out these ideas and uh, we've got a brilliant staff body. So you, you get great discussion. But I really held back from putting this up. They were saying, I said to them, so what might this look like in, in my classroom, in, in your classroom, in my, my kind of my way of trying to pose a meaningful question? And they were like, give me some examples. And I was like, oh, I don't want to, because these at their best are metacognition and at their worst, they're not. Um, and you'll know this with anything. Um, you know, when you pick up a resource, somebody else's resource, and you think you know how to use it, and then you go and do it in the lesson, it doesn't quite work. Um, it's all about the facilitation and the teacher, because I have seen kind of knowledge organisers that are in no way metacognitive. You know, if they're a list of questions, um, you know, a list of topics for my year 13s in psychology, and I say, right, you've got your knowledge organiser, use it to check everything's in your folder. Brilliant. Let's move on. Some have got gaps, have done nothing about it. 
Um, some have got loads of notes, far too many on something. And again, I've done nothing about it. They've literally highlighted red, orange, green. They don't really know which is which. I've not standardized what orange means. I've not asked any follow up questions. Um, so these things can be really ineffective. However, with challenge, with questioning and with action, they can absolutely, absolutely be fundamental. So that sit, sits underneath these. Um, I bet there is something on here that is a bit of a thing at your school. So exam wrappers have become a bit of a thing at our school at the moment. So students come out their mocks, um, sorry, they're still in the mock hall and they have to kind of on an exam wrapper put their initial thoughts about what was easy, what was hard. They get a bit of extra time to do that. So what's the thing in the chat box? If you had to pick one, what is the thing that you think at the moment is a bit of a, a buzzword around school? I'm not going to say fad because that suggests it would come and go, um, but you probably know what I mean. Is there any of those? Hmm, <laughs> green pen, red pen. Yeah, we love a green pen. Doesn't matter that it's green, it's about what they do with it, but yeah, absolutely. Hmm, success criteria slips, yeah. Two stars and a wish in primary. Two things that went well, what I wish I'd got. What I want to do next, what I need to do next. Okay, brilliant. Some excellent ones coming through. And like I say, there's nothing wrong with them. I'm not being critical of them or I wouldn't have put them on the slide on the board. But I think the number one question I often say to staff is how does it help them plan, monitor or evaluate? Because if you can't explain the how, then, then it, it's not particularly effective. And the students need to know as well, what is the point in me doing this? Um, so yeah, all of these things can be super effective in the classroom. And the reality is that they've probably been driven by metacognition. That's probably why they're being said um, as things in your classroom quite frequently at the moment. So all effective, all can go at the beginning, front and the end. But like I said, all about the facilitation of those things and how they help students. So my question when I did this was, what does this look like in your team? You know, what would you expect to see while this was going on? So modelling, we've looked at a little bit. So modelling by the teacher is a cornerstone of effective teaching. And I think I realised this probably in my third year of teaching. I don't know about you guys, but like teaching A level in my first school was like the pinnacle of being as a NQT as it was then, now ECT. Um, it, you know, if you managed to get to teach A level three or four years in, you were doing well, you kind of had to wait for someone to retire to be able to teach A level. Um, so I finally, as a psychologist even, you know, lots of key stage four, finally got my hands. And um, that's when it gets hard actually, because I'm trying to model something that's not necessarily easy to me. And I think that's really important because that's what our students do every day. They're trying to do something that they don't find easy, hopefully if we've pitched it right. So what I would do as a teacher is I would model essays. That that tends to be the first thing that comes to people's minds. And I'd say, OK, so we need to write the introduction. What does the introduction need to do? And then they'd all write one and we'd discuss some key terms that we were all agreed needed to be in there. OK, now we need to do evaluation. What does evaluation look like? And so on and so forth. And uh, a teacher said to me, my um, they weren't my mentor anymore, but they'd, they'd been my mentor previously, said, oh, you're doing I, we, you. I said, am I? I can do this and I'm showing you, we can do the answer and then you're going to go off and do it on your own. And I really liked that modelling being seen as I, we, you, I'm going to do it, we're going to do it together. And then the outcome should be that you can go off and do it on your own, because if you can't do the you bit, we need to come back to the we bit. Um, and it was a really nice collaborative language, I, we, you, and it comes up quite a lot. So I just thought I'd share that with you again, something you can Little idea you can share with your students saying, I, we, you, this is how we're going to go. It gives a bit of confidence. Um, and if you can't do it, I got it wrong. So we need to go back and try again together. So quite a nice language, even when they're 17, 18. So teach modelling is about verbalising metacognitive thinking. So what do I know about problems like this? What are the ways of solving them? Sharing the fact that you are the expert learner. So teach modelling is all about verbalising our thought process and again, doing that explicitly. And the best teachers always do it. They just don't necessarily know why they're doing it. So talking out loud can help learners to focus and monitor their cognitive processing as well and helping them to develop a deeper understanding of their own thinking process. I appreciate the difference between summative and formative assessment. I think we probably as an education do far more um, summative than maybe we should. Um, I'm a real fan of walking, talking mocks. 
of doing a mock paper with the textbook open, talking with a friend, because um, we're all going to get full marks because we've got everything that we need. Um, and then withdrawing that support as you go. Um, so again, metacognitive talk not being something just that the teacher does, um, but something that the students do as well. So a classroom dialogue is key. And I did a previous session to the, this one on oracy. Um, and I'll show you a slide in a minute that brings it all together. But as a school, we really fo focus on oracy and metacognition because the two are in, inherently linked because um, metacognitive talk is that coming together of being able to articulate yourself and link it to how you're learning. Um, and that dialogue can happen people to people, people to teacher. Um, and actually, when it becomes people to people, it's really beautiful. Some of my, you know, my loveliest moments are when kids say things like, oh, your conclusion's too short, where's this? Uh, and it's so non-threatening. And I use that tone because that's how my teenagers talk to each other sometimes. Um, but it's really helpful when you've got, you, you're one person in a classroom to get around 30 children is so difficult if you have got their peers starting to say to them, oh, you know, she says, uh, we need to do that. It's, it's absolutely fab. And you'll have all had those moments where you think, ha ha, we are getting there. So this is an idea on some of the language you can use for metacognition from a book. Um, and I'm not going to labour on this slide too much, but I am going to show you the book cover for this book um, because it's really practical. Education Endowment Fund is a brilliant piece of research that gives you the underlying principles of metacognition. But the metacognition handbook is very much my favourite read. It's not expensive. Um, I don't even know the lady that wrote it. I'm not selling it. Um, but it just gives you really practical sentence starters, activities. And I just think that's kind of what you're after. So I will show you that in a moment. So have you been paying attention is my question. In the chat box, there has been imagery throughout this PowerPoint presentation. What film has all the imagery been from? And there's a whacking great clue. There's your, there's your scaffolding on the screen. Okay, so CPD at Shenley Brook End, it's almost compulsory that fancy dress is involved. And um, so we had a whole staff training on our school pedagogy, which is on here. Um, now, you don't need to know my school's pedagogy. Um, different schools believe in different things at different times. I don't assign particularly to any one thing. I think good teaching and learning is just good teaching and learning. Um, but our school pedagogy is focused around talking, thinking, doing. So RSC, metacognition, and something called the Magenta Principles by a, a man called Mike Smith. Um, Mike Hughes, sorry. Sorry, Mike. Um, Mike Hughes. So when we are talking about metacognition, we link it into things that we're already doing in school. I think that's really important as you become future middle leaders. I think if something gets plopped into a school in isolation to things that have been doing, it gets seen as a bolt on and a hassle and a load of work. So we were very key to draw it into what we we're already doing. But Wizard of Oz. OK, so the wizard, if you had to use this is I'm um, banking on some childhood knowledge here. The theme was the Wizard of Oz. We were all dressed up as different Wizard of Oz characters. What one word, if you had to pick one, would you use to describe the wizard in the Wizard of Oz? Too long ago, that's fine, don't worry. I did this with um, staff and someone was like, green? I was like, mm, yeah, that's not quite what I'm going for. Come on, James, help me out. One word to describe the Wizard of Oz, what do you reckon? So I see if he's gone off to have a coffee. I know, I'm still here. I'm, I'm just racking my brain, struggling to remember. <laughs> um, is, is the one that is it the Wizard of Oz the melted, the one that melted? No, that's the, the Wicked Witch. Witch. That's the Wicked Witch. It's, it's been that long. Okay, I'm going to do a synopsis for us. Don't worry. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> so, Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, the whole film is trying to get to the Emerald City. That's what's in the background here. And she meets people on the way Scarecrow, Cowardly Lion, uh, she's got a dog. Um, just to find the wizard because the wizard is going to help her get home and then she gets there and the wizard the best word to describe the wizard is an absolute fraud he isn't a wizard at all he landed in oz in a hot air balloon about 30 years previous they all thought he could fly because he was in a hot air balloon and it's technology they'd never seen before and he has absolutely no way of getting them home so the wizard is an absolute fraud because the film the wizard of oz isn't about the wizard it's about dorothy and Dorothy basically has the ability to get home from the first scene. She's given some ruby slippers by Glenda, the good witch. 
So the whole film, she could have got home, but she has to meet the people along the way to learn the lessons she needs to learn to get home. So it's all about the journey. It's all about the learning. And this was the theme of our training day. Kids have got everything they need to succeed, but they just don't know how to access it. They need their friend. They need their cowardly lion. They need their tin man. They need their scarecrow. They need these skills. So we talked about the fact that our students need help in being independent. Dorothy saves herself. It's like a feminism film way before its time. Dorothy saves herself, but she needs her friends to do it and she needs the learning and the skills that she gathers along the way. So The Wizard of Oz is all about the journey and the skills, hence, hence the theme. We also had a little bit of pastoral training that we were trying to shoehorn in. It was all about relationships and having a heart. So our deputy head was very pleased to have to dress as a tin man. Um, but this story that we use, we often refer back to as staff, that it's about, metacognition is about, if learning is the consequence of thinking, our students need to think. And our job is to get the students to think, but we have to give them the tools to be able to do it. And they are plan, monitor, evaluate, they are modeling and they are scaffolding. And I think if you make metacognition anything more complicated than that, it becomes something that, it sits alongside what we do rather than core to we do. So that's my kind of my key evangelical bit. So key bits to remember about metacognition in the classroom. It's that everyday teaching, not asking anybody to do anything they've never do, done before, or have a bolt on or a worksheet. Students need to be trained. We start with appropriate scaffolding and we take it away over time. It's what we do. We use questioning. We model as often as, as, as we possibly can. We break down skills and we model that. We use metacognitive talk and we appreciate metacognition is only effective when it's pitched at the appropriate level. So knowing when to put the scaffold in, in and when to take it away. So just some go to's if you do want to go and have a look a little bit more at metacognition. Um, but metacognition is in the Education Endowment Fund on the report. And the book that I was talking about is there. Um, lots of practical activities in it, practical ideas, ways to model and scaffold in. Um, I'm sure lots of them you'll know, but I think the best teaching and learning books just remind us why we do what we do. I don't think it's about reinventing the wheel. I think it's just being purposeful um, about what we do. So I have one last question for you. You're going to go away from this session and do one thing. What are we going to do? I'm helping you plan. You're going to monitor what you've heard. You're going to evaluate whether you're doing it or not. What one thing are you going to go away and do more of purposefully? doesn't have to be brand new, but as a result of this session, so that we've all got a promise that we've made. <laughs> Watch The Wizard of Oz. Brilliant. And then identify the plan, monitor and evaluate within my planning. Brilliant. Thank you. So that you explicitly know when you're intending for the students to do it. I think that's fab, Ben. Thank you very much. Encourage reflection and monitoring of my year fours during tasks and learning. Yeah, brilliant. It's lovely to have primary here as well, Chris. I think primary teachers are absolutely fab as the mum of a six year old myself. Yeah, teaching explicit examples. Absolutely. Brilliant. OK, thank you very much, um, James. I'll pass back over to you if that's all right. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. I think I think likewise for Ben, I'm going to have to go and watch The Wizard of Oz again and just remind myself. I, I, I know the whole story and the characters and the principles of and actually I think ultimately you can still get that analogy. It's the journey that's the important part. Um, and I, I suppose whether it's the insignificance of the wizard in the whole story as a result of the fact that he is a fraud, but I'll, I'll go, I'll have to go and watch it. But no, I think I think fundamentally a lot of metacognition, as you've sort of highlighted and alluded to, is about that quality first teaching or, or, or that principles of, of good teaching. And I think sort of Ben is, is kind of where I would align to is that I wouldn't necessarily probably have to change anything I'm doing. It's more just a case of being explicit and having that definitive, have I have I actually built that in and it's not then a bolt on additional workload or anything like that so really really uh, sort of pertinent points as are and thank you massively for giving that overview and reminding me that I have forgotten my childhood <laughs> <with those stars. laughs> but uh, but yeah by all means please like with anyone uh, who's attending the sessions or watching these sessions back on our YouTube page do check out the Education Endowment Fund and a lot of the work they do around medical admission there's an awful lot of stuff there and practical application uh, for bits and pieces as well um, and equally, you know, looking into some of the reading uh, further with, within this topic as well. But 
This will be recorded, as I say, up on our YouTube page fairly, very shortly, and you'll be able to catch up on any of the previous sessions, as well as any future sessions that you may wish to attend as well. So last thing to say, really uh, massive thank you, Zara. Um, really, really good uh, insights into metacognition.